On this episode of This Week of Space, we're talking about our favorite space conspiracies, and you know what to expect. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 67, recorded on June 23rd, 2023. Our favorite space conspiracies. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that drastically increases your chances of staying safe online. You can get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Our Favorite Space Conspiracies Edition. Yes, it's time for those. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and I'm joined by the indivisible Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief of Space.com. How are you today, sir? I'm doing well, Rod. How are you? How are you doing today, Rod? I'm, I'm fine. I'm marveling at your groovy new headphones. Yeah, yeah. I'm They're trying very to solve, stylish. Trying to solve some, some audio, audio problems, so uh, I'll try these ones and, and we'll see how they go. But uh, they do keep my ears warm, which will be nice in the winter. Well, it's good to know they, they solve more problems than just your audio. There are so many left. <laughs> so before we begin, we have a new Space Dad joke from Ooh. me. Oh, oh, it's from you. Okay. Why I'll, did I'll the laugh. rocket... Huh? Ha, ha, ha. I laughed uh, in advance. In advance? Uh, Appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> I really hate you. So, <laughs> hey, Tarek. Uh, yes, Rod. Why did the rocket go to the doctor? Uh, why? Why did the rocket go to the doctor? I don't know. Because it had a burning sensation down below. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a first. As always, we invite you to join Malik's Marauders and send us your best or worst space joke. And don't forget to do us a solid. Make sure to like, subscribe, and all that cool podcast stuff. After all, it's free. Now, before we begin today, I would be remiss if uh, I didn't mention the loss of the submersible Titan. Yeah. Very sad. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to remember the people aboard that submarine and their families and the support crew. Uh, apparently, the wreckage was found yesterday on the ocean floor after days of searching. And it's it's really a sad moment for adventurers everywhere and a reminder that all frontiers are dangerous. And I'm sure you've been carrying, uh, covering this story at depth. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, this was, um, it's not often that you have like ocean uh, disasters, you know, mix with, uh, with the space industry, but, uh, you know, there were five, uh, five crew on this, uh, uh, this Titan submersible. Uh, the, uh, one of them was, um, uh, sadly, uh, Hamish Harding, uh, a space tourist who did fly, uh, with, uh, Blue Origin, uh, last year and, uh, actually flew around the world with an NASA astronaut, Terry Vertz. Uh, and, uh, and then also, um, uh, uh, Shazada uh, Dawood, the uh, uh, Pakistani businessman, was a, a SETI trustee as well, uh, who uh, sadly died with his son uh, uh, as well on the on on the trip there. And of course, you had the, the French Navy diver Paul Henry uh, Nargalay and um, and the the founder um, uh, Stockton Rush uh, of uh, of the company OceanGate that that built that that sub there, um, and Dawood's son uh, uh, Suleiman uh, too. So just a, a tragic loss of life uh, for for that, and it is. Like you say, like a reminder that this stuff is risky, even if it sounds glamorous. Um, and I, you can probably bet that the uh, commercial space tourism industry is uh, is going to look at what lessons that they can learn, even though they are very different uh, different industries uh, for their own type of um, vehicles themselves. Yeah, they are, and 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 yet, as you mentioned, you know that conversation started the background right away. People who were involved with are thinking a lot about space tourism. Looked at this and thought, "Oof, you know, this is a reminder." I don't know if it's a wake up call, but it's certainly a reminder that these things are dangerous. And yeah. you know, when people embark on these, you you sign waivers, and it basically says, "Look, I'm willing to take the risk." And I guess over time, we'll have to tease out. <clears throat> how much risk people are willing to take and you know, how that's, how that's measured in advance. But yeah, um, yeah very sad. All right. Well, on that note, let us go on to some headlines because you're the headline guy. Oh yes. <laughs> so well, um, to, 
from from something not really sad news to at least some some more optimistic yes uh, you know, news. Uh, well, we had uh, a really interesting event this week. Uh, Europe's Bepi Colombo spacecraft, which is uh, getting ever closer to the planet Mercury, uh, made a uh, its latest flyby of Mer- Mercury, um, coming within about 150 miles. And while you know a flyby doesn't sound all that great, the new images from the spacecraft and some videos that they were able to put together from the European Space Agency just really uh, blew our, um, uh, uh, you know, I guess I was going to say blew our pants off, but I don't think you, I don't think that's how it goes. Knocked our sock <laughs> off. Um, and uh, I mean, just spectacular views of the closest planet to the sun. Uh, and and it's, you know, just kind of another, another, um, uh, uh, appetizer for what we really are expecting to see from Bepi Colombo in the near future once it enters its final, final orbit uh, around um, around Mercury. Not the first uh, spacecraft to orbit Mercury. NASA's Messenger spacecraft uh, did an amazing job uh, back in uh, uh, 2011 to 2015. Uh, but um, uh, but this is, you know, the, the latest one that we have uh, that's going to be there. It's going to be looking to understand why Mercury looks the way that it does, uh, why it's uh, it has such a, a weird kind of exosphere uh, and um, and you know why it just acts so much differently than all the other planets in our our, our solar system so uh, just a, a really fun um, a fun flyby and you know it's 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 fl- it's flown by earth it, it's done uh, two flybys of Venus this spacecraft and two other uh, flybys of Mercury in 2021 and 2022 so you know uh, if everything goes well uh, then in December of uh, 2025 after three more flybys of Mercury, uh, it'll enter its final, final orbit, and we're going to see some amazing views of the planet like we've never seen it before. Well, it's high time. If Venus is the trailer park of the solar system, Mercury has <laughs> sort of been the scum pond out behind the trailer park. It just doesn't get much love. And I think it was the first mission in the late 60s or the early 70s? Well, I want to Mariner, say 70s right? with, Mar- with Mariner, but uh, yeah. I, could be, I could be wrong there. But, it's hard to get to Mercury. All these flybys... Right. Uh, are an example of how difficult it is just to slow down and lose the energy as you're falling towards the sun. Uh, and, and you know, we there was another flyby this week. The uh, uh, Parker Solar Probe uh, reached perihelion of, its, of the sun on its latest flyby as it also tries to get closer and closer and passing through the uh, the outer atmosphere of our star. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's got the same issue. It's it's falling in so fast it needs to try to to shed a lot of that velocity to get them to get into a stable, close orbit. All right. Moving along. That was from space.com, of course, yes. where you live. Uh, that's right. And I mean that somewhat literally. <laughs> uh, from Live Science, your, your friends down the street, we have a story called The Expansion of the Universe May Be a Mirage. Do tell us why. Yeah. So apparently everything we know about the universe uh, and how it's expanding. It's a lie. Around, it's a simulation. Right. Yeah. No, this uh, this is a new study. You know, there's there's been this... Uh, uh, this this kind of mismatch in terms of like how scientists measure the expansion of the universe. Uh, you know, we know that it's expanding because there's this redshift single uh, where light is like stretching uh, over time and it's getting worse as we, you know, target objects that are really far away. So they're like, okay, the, the universe is expanding and it's that expansion is accelerating over time. But um, they've had like differences in, in the actual observations of this, this unit called Lambda. And they, it's been, adding uh, a little bit of, of confusion. It's the cosmological, cosmological constant, pardon me. Mm-hmm. And this new study by um, a researcher uh, at the University of Geneva, his name is uh, Lucas uh, Lombriser. I think I'm pronouncing that right. He's a theoretical physicist. Um, he got it published in Classical and Quantum Gravity. And, and he says that they've, there's, a, um, th- you know, there's a way to explain that discrepancy if the expansion rate you know, isn't what we think it is. And, uh, and Basically, they're saying that 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 constant problem, you know, isn't isn't really there, and it disappears if they have a new take on uh, on the um, uh, on the model of how we think our universe works. And so that expansion just it it just could be like an after effect of what we're seeing with our observational techniques. And uh, and if we accept that that things are, are fluctuating a little bit, it'll solve the problem. I mean, it's it's a very kind of new uh, uh, new take he says that in this in this picture that they, they wouldn't have to have dark energy to explain the acceleration of the universe you know that's why we have that because we know that 
the acceleration of the of, of the um, the expansion is happening, but we don't know what the energy is. So it must be dark energy and energy type that we can't see. Uh, and with this new theory, you know, if if the um, uh, uh, the the great, you know, if if it's not happening there, uh, that kind of solves, solves that. It would, you wouldn't have to have these invisible things that we can't see or these hypothetical mm. particles. So. Um, so it'd be, it'd be interesting to see if this, if this pairs out, but it is, it is a new, a new theory. Uh, I'm sure that people are going to be looking at it to see if, if they can actually prove, uh, prove it or disprove it. Uh, and I'm sure there's some people that are very attached to dark energy that would like to make sure that, um, they haven't been wasting their lives with their research that they're doing uh, so far. You know, an attachment to dark energy sounds potentially painful, but I, <laughs> I must say, you know, when we do these stories, I have this moment where I think, gosh, in my next life, I want to come back as one of those guys that, you know, looks at the the most mangled part of that paper and, and looks at all that math that goes, oh, yeah, oh, that 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 factor's wrong instead of <laughs> feeling like a meerkat, you know. I tell you, but, I, tell you uh, I had a, an astronomy final and the answers were uh, explain right. the dark matter problem and derive the Einstein Riemann tensor. And I almost fainted in, in the desk. And that was it. That was, those were the only two questions on the test. So what? Yeah. That was the whole final. That was the final. Yes. I took an astronomy class in the seventies, <clears throat> uh, at, uh, my community college where we had, an uh, you know, community college professors are, are, are very devoted to their jobs, but they're usually not the ones that would have been at Harvard next week, or they not at the community college. So, I mean, some are, most aren't. We had a guy who had graduated from Caltech, who was a brilliant PhD, and he had a thing about making sure that you took astronomy seriously. And of course, being a community college and being open enrollment and, and being the kind of place that a lot of people just went to take classes for fun, as opposed to myself, who was climbing, trying to climb into UCLA at the time. Um, we had a lot of people that thought they were in astrology class and we went from, I think 55 students on day one to seven or eight by the time I was taking the final, which, uh, he, he gave us a bunch of coordinates and sun sighting, uh, latitudes and so forth. And the last question on the final, it was three pages. The last question was figure out where you are on earth and a hint you're in a body of water. And I think I had to create a small pond somewhere in the back roads of Montana to make it work. And it was wrong, but it gave me partial credit for my methodology. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 so much of life has worked out for me because of partial credit. I think uh, <laughs> maybe this podcast included. I don't know. I'll give you partial credit for that story. right? There. Well, I appreciate that. And I'll give you partial credit for that peach colored shirt you're wearing today. For those of you not watching the video. But before we launch into more insults at Tark, let's. Uh, My shirt pause. has a collar. We should all be happy for that today. So. <laughs> Okay, moment of silence for the collar of your shirt. Uh, <laughs> let's let's take a break and hear from our friends at Bitwarden. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go and is trusted by millions. Even our very own Steve Gibson, our favorite Steve Gibson, has switched over. With Bitwarden, all the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. You can protect your data and privacy with Bitwarden by adding security to your passwords with strong randomly generated passwords for each account. You can go further with the username generator, creating unique usernames for each account or even use any of the five integrated email alias services. Bitwarden is open source with all the code available on GitHub for anyone to view. This means you don't have to take their word for it. You can see that it's completely secure. On top of being public to the world, Bitwarden also has professional third-party audits performed every year, and the results are also published on their website. This is open source security that you can trust. Bitwarden's also launched a new Bitwarden Secrets Manager, currently in beta. It's an end-to-end -end encrypted solution that allows teams of developers to centrally secure, manage, and deploy sensitive secrets like API keys and machine credentials. Secret Manager keeps those sensitive developer secrets out of the source code and eliminates the risk of them being exposed to the public. Bitwarden needs developers to help test out the new Secrets Manager and provide feedback. You can learn more at bitwarden.com slash secrets beta. Share private security securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans. 
Bitwarden's Teams organization option is $3 a month per user, while their enterprise organization plan is just $5 a month per user. Individuals can always use the basic free account for an unlimited number of passwords, upgrade at any time to a premium account for less than $1 per month, or bring the whole family with their family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. At Twit, we're fans of password managers. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work, and is trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. You can get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. And we're back. And we're here to talk about <laughs> our favorite conspiracies, which I'm probably going to have to take these off to read because these really awesome sunglasses are just a little much. All right. So I love it. I love it, Rod. So I wanted to start with just kind of laying out the sort of the why of the conspiracies before we get into the what. So I was I was looking around this week, various papers. And I've done a couple of shows in the past for History Channel, and I think one for Discovery about uh, about things that involve the UFOs and conspiracies. Um, I remember talking to a psychologist once from, oh, I think she was from UC Berkeley, talking about uh, the whole abduction thing, you know, yes. why so many people think they've been abducted by aliens. And she had just written this paper about waking paralysis and so forth, which I don't know if you've ever experienced that I have a couple of times and it is pretty terrifying. Although I never, uh, hallucinated that I was being probed by green skin creatures, but it is a weird phenomenon, but that's, that's an aside. So here's a paper I, I dug up, um, that basically gives you kind of a working definition and and just to 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 prepare for that you know the whole psychology i think of the conspiracy theories we'll be talking about many of them have nasa and or the u.s government as targets and at, at the core of this is uh to some extent a lack of critical thinking i mean <laughs> it, it sounds kind of um like I'm talking down, I'm not. It's just not something that's taught very well. I mean, public schools are struggling to get the, the basics of math and reading and so forth done for a lot of kids. And critical thinking is something that just doesn't always get a lot of airtime. So here's a working definition from an APA, American Psychological Association paper. Conspiracy theory can normally be defined as a proposed plot carried out in secret, usually by a powerful group of people who have some kind of sinister goal. So something to gain from what they're doing, and they usually don't have people's best interests at heart. Usually they have their own interests at heart. And there's uh, the paper goes on to express concerns that conspiracy theories are on the rise due to easy access to social media and self-reinforcing algorithms. And for any of us that ever expressed an opinion or a preference online, you do know that you do that two or three times. And the next thing you know, that's all you're getting in your social media feed yeah. and your advertising stream. So, you know, if I happen to mention somebody, yeah, I couldn't find a screwdriver the other day, the next thing you know, I'm going to be getting 40 ads for Harbor Freight tools and, and that kind of thing. So, and, and the politically, of course, the same, if you're, if you're on Facebook or Twitter or something and you express a certain kind of opinion, you're going to start getting more and more material from those opinions. So if you happen to be even just curious about conspiracy theories or UFOs or anything, you're going to suddenly be wading through a swamp of that material and who wouldn't be affected like that. Um, so it, it, it also noted in another paper the conspiracies, uh, like so many things in our lives, seem to hit a rise whenever a new form of media is introduced. And we're talking about, I mean, the first books, when the first books were printed back in Gutenberg's day, conspiracies usually ab about local civil government came into the rise. Certainly when newspapers began to become popular in the West, radio, radio TV, yes. And of course, the internet. Every time one of these things comes online, and before just the full internet, we had a uh, message boards, right? Oh yeah, uh, which are like right places that just go down a rabbit hole. And oh yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, they were uh, they were quite something. And you're staring at it in in on a, a green and black monochrome screen, right? <laughs> That's right. Those were the days. So finally, um, so these are some of the causes. What are some of the motivations? Well, there's the desire for more information and truth, quote unquote. Your truth is out there, kind of thinking. Uh, it does seem to rise during, during periods and times of uncertainty. That may be because people are, are feeling less secure. It may be because they have more time on their hands. If there's high, high unemployment levels, you're spending more time digging in, into some of these stuff. There was, uh, a, 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 in a number of these studies, there was a, a citation about lower education levels um, and not saying that these people were not intelligent, but that that, that sometimes indicated an increased erotic conspiracy theories, possibly due to less training and critical thinking, as I was citing earlier. Um, also, desire for safety and certainty in uncertain periods, a desire to feel good about themselves, the groups they are part of, and indeed, sometimes just being part of a group. And finally, a desire to know, and I think this is a big one, a desire to know something special, to know secrets, to know hidden information and agendas, and it has have a sense of uniqueness and even sometimes superiority. And depending on how much time you spent with what subgroups, I think that can become pretty apparent that there's this kind of notion of, well, I'm special because I know something you don't get your head out of the sand. And I can't tell you how many times I've been at a conference or something and people sidled up and said, hey, you're. You know, I know you're covering up NASA secrets with Photoshop and, and your lies online and so forth. And get your head out of the sand. Or sometimes <laughs> they're telling me to get my head out of something else and understand what's really going on. Oh, so, yes, it's a, never a dull moment when yes. they, can just, they can reach you at the click of a button. So, <laughs> yeah, well, or in this case, by a grab of the lapel. That was the creepy part. Oh, it's man. Like, Hi. Yeah, it was everything but the tinfoil hat I had last week. So you put down a, a, a very good point here, the Tunguska meteor explosion. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'd forgotten about that. And well, of course, we all know it's antimatter drives on a UFO, right? Well, well should, should we go? How, how do you want to do this? Because these are all like our picks yeah. for those space conspiracies that, that won't die. Do you want to do one and then I'll do one? We've got the biggie that we, we haven't touched about that it's like everyone's going to like want to know about, which well, is, of course. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the the moon landing, right? Because that never happened. Right, what Ron? moon landing? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. What moon? Right. Um, That's a whole other. Yeah, one. But let's, let's. I didn't even put that on here, right? That the right. moon is like a like a giant egg thing or whatever, like it's or like a cardboard a, disc. <laughs> um, why don't you take Tunguska? Because that, that's a fun story. Tell us what it is first. Yeah. So so know. for 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 the listeners in the know, in 1908, uh, a meteorite exploded uh, over the 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 Tunguska in, in, in Siberia, uh, the, the forest there. And it like big explosion level, lots of trees, a uh, lot, lot of, lot of really great photos of, of that whole thing. And, uh, and apparently, uh, and I didn't know this until, you know, I was working at space.com, but there was this conspiracy that it wasn't an actual meteor explosion uh, at all, but that it was a, an extraterrestrial device, uh, you know, like a, a drive for an alien ship that blew up. And, and those remains were still out there and it was a big cover up, right? They got, they got all the people out uh, and, and the Russians were, were going there to try to recover uh, alien debris. And so much so that back in 2004, which was, I think just as I was, still like like a, like a part-timer here at, at space.com maybe i was mm -hmm. full-time actually um then uh, a, a team of of scientists decided to go on an expedition to go find that that debris and and the alien device and and, and come back and and of course uh according to um benny Pizer, a, a researcher at uh, liverpool uh liverpool, liverpool's john moore's university in the uk of course that, that they said that that's what they're going to go find and then they found some something and then they came back and said of course that was the alien spaceship look we found it it, it was there you know uh, <laughs> a hundred, uh, nearly 100 years after the, the event that it was still uh, out there in the um uh in the siberian forest uh, waiting and you know it's it's pretty well documented that it was a meteor explosion you know they have the, the aftermath they were able to, to detect all those telltale signs of, of the meteor they had eyewitnesses uh that saw it happen um but you know this this study uh, it was it was it was enough it was enough to to to, to draw uh, and, and keep these scientists you know alive and and um, one of the the scientists I mean I was 
you know, that we, we talked to back in 2004 called it a rather stupid hoax. And yet it was one that people were still believing in the 21st century uh, uh, and keeping that going. So uh, it's just, it's one of those that just seems really, really silly when you look at it uh, with a, a, a lens, especially because we saw another meteor explosion over uh, Chelyabinsk in real time with modern mm -hmm. uh, uh, attempts. And it was clearly not. Uh, an alien device or an alien ship exploding. It was a space rock that everyone saw, and then they went and found like the debris from the space rock itself. Uh, and now those are in museums and labs being analyzed. So, um, but that's 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 the one that I think is kind of like the 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 most adorable one that I that adorable. I <laughs> so that they that 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 explosion. And I, I've heard similar versions of this for other things too, like Saint Helens uh, eruption. That it was like a. Hmm. A nuclear test. I've, I'd heard that, but that was probably one of the what? first conspiracy tests, conspiracy theories that I ever heard. And I think I was oh, a kid man. growing up, and like an adult told that to me at that time before there even was an internet. You know, kind of shakes your your faith in adults, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, we all know Mount St. Helens was a miniature black hole. So come on. <laughs> there you go. But, there you go. All right. So the next one, and this is the elephant in the room, as you said. And I'll try not to sound condescending or dismissive here, because. I know that it's it's very widely debated, but the we never landed on the moon theory. That's right. Body of belief. Which, <laughs> oh, look at this. Look at this. I love if it. You, <laughs> yeah. So Some, uh, if you're watching the journey. video stream. <laughs> yeah. If you're if. Oh, you whipped that up. Yeah. Just now. Yeah. Or earlier today. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Anthony. This is uh, Anthony who's on the board today. Did this lovely rendering of a bunch of astronauts standing around on what's obviously a moon set with interestingly a fake Russian lander, I believe, uh, <laughs> looking at it. Uh, so, um, yeah, there's there's been tons of theories whipping around about this ever since the day that, that uh, Neil and Buzz first set foot on the moon. And if you look at the surveys and the studies on this, uh, I believe, depending on the time period you're talking about, and not all that recently, something like 72% of the Russian public does not believe that America landed on the moon, which at one time or another was a belief it may have been fostered by a certain amount of propaganda from their government, although not at the moment it happened, I don't think, as I recall. And oddly... In Asia, the belief is quite high. So the, the numbers of doubters are down in single digits in some Asian countries. In the UK, Tarek, for some reason, it's about 52%. Why, why are you calling me out for that? I, <laughs> I live in New Jersey. So. I just wanted to make the point, Tarek. But I mean, half is, is I feel attacked. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I just found it very puzzling. I, I sort of thought, oh, my my brethren from from, you know, Centuries gone by. That's where my family came from. How can yeah. you disbelieve? So, so, so it, the, the, the the conspiracy theory is that we never landed on the moon. That it was all mm -hmm. fake, right. like shot on a set somewhere. Um, and uh, and then there's lots of different claims, right? There's no stars in the background. Are we going to talk about that well, stuff? But, or, uh, yeah, sorry. but let's not forget that not only was it shot on a soundstage, but it was of course directed by Stanley Kubrick. Who uh, there I was, mean. 2001 came out about the same time, right? 1968, Just, yes, right. which was very convincing. And Kubrick supposedly make a deathbed, made a deathbed confession at one point. There was supposedly <laughs> videotape of somebody who looked in the shadows vaguely like Kubrick lying there gasping for air saying, yeah, I done it. And I mean, you know, it wouldn't take a whole lot in shadows for me to look like Stanley Kubrick in his last days. So... <laughs> There are a lot of ways to fake that, but and especially now, of course, but this was, you know, pre-AI, so it was probably makeup and so forth. Um, and, and as Tarek said, there's there's so so those are the claims. Now let's look at some of the evidence people cite. Well, we should say all the claims though first. Like I only okay. mentioned like a couple of them. Like, number one, it was shot on the on a sound stage. Number two was that there's no stars in the images or the video on the moon. Right. Right. So that's the other one. Number three is that the um the flag was waving, right? Like it was a day, yes. like a windy day on the moon. Uh, or are there other other claims from that? We've got... Oh, uh, um, let's see. I can see wires mm -hmm. has been, been cited. Uh, and, you know, a lot of this is sadly supported by... Uh, there's been a series of documentaries in Britain. And our very own Fox Network in the U.S. has, has produced more... 
schlock about this and alien encounters and all that that I can even begin to um, recall. There are, were claims that it was too hard. Everybody knows you can't fly to the moon. And and I have to admit, you know, having written a number of books about this, when I look back from today, I'm still sort of stunned that it worked because yeah. when you look at the levels of tech, which are just crawling out of the 1950s when they started this program, you know, we were just coming off of vacuum tubes. But if you look closer at all this and go to the museums and go to NASA facilities and crawl around and look at the records and look at the hardware and everything, you know, it, it would take almost as much money to build and buy and pay for the conspiracy <laughs> than it would to actually do it. So I mean, you, you could push back and forth uh, about that. Um, some of this started with a book in 1974 by a jet named Bill Casing, K-A-Y-S-I-N-G, mm -hmm. who was a former Rocketdyne writer, not engineer, but a, a tech writer or a PR writer for them and a former Navy officer. He wrote a book called We Never Went to the Moon, America's $30 billion Swindle. Now, this is self-published in 1974. When you self-published, it was embarrassing. It's a little more acceptable today, but it was considered vanity publishing back then. So this began this industry of doubting. And the other bookend of that is, of course, our good friend, Dmitry Rogozin of oh. the Russian Space Program, <laughs> who claimed a number of things. And part of this is you can't fly through the Van Allen belts. They'll kill you. Um, uh, the, the things Tarek pointed out. Uh, reticle marks, the little etch cross, etch crosses that you see on a lot of the moon pictures being behind objects. So clearly it was faked, um, which turns out to be simply an illusion on the print due to exposure, which is the same thing about the stars, by the way. Mm -hmm. If you expose to get the foreground right in a fully lit moon, which has glass and metal in the soil and everything else, you're just not going to see stars. And anybody who's ever taken a picture knows that. And if Ant was here, we'd have him. Um, weigh in on that. But my favorite, my favorite of the doubters is the rolling Coke bottle. Have you heard that one? <laughs> no, I haven't heard this one. So some so. woman claimed that while she was watching a moonwalk, I forget which one, I think weirdly it might have been Apollo 12, which of course nobody watched because the camera burned out. <laughs> but she claimed she saw a sight of a Coke bottle rolling across the surface of the moon while the astronaut was walking. Wow. And clearly, uh, yeah. And then another uh, more. Uh, there's no crater under the lunar module when it landed. Well, they shut off the engine about 10 feet above the surface and then mm -hmm. it just dropped. Um, and so on and so on. So, And then we have, of course, people like Bart Seibrel, who's written a bunch of stuff about this and was famously punched out by Buzz Aldrin when he was <laughs> now mowing him. I think Buzz is on his way into a hotel. Oh, yeah. You can Google it. You can see the clip it's on YouTube. <laughs> it's so great. I mean, this clown is following Buzz around, holding a Bible. Put your hand on this Bible and swear you went to the moon. And poor Buzz, you know, he turns away from him eight or nine times and says, please leave me alone. And then finally, after begging this guy to go away, just just decks him. It was such <laughs> a beautiful moment. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, that's a bit of an aside. But, I mean, what do you think, Tarek? How do we convince people? I think we were there because it, it took a lot. Now I've got my evidence, but I want to hear yours. It, it is a fun conspiracy theory to believe, right? Because it has all those Hollywood uh, makings. In fact, there was a movie starring the guy that plays Ron Weasley, you know, where, where they have to, in fact, fake the moon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so there's like a whole movie just about that. There's a James Bond movie where they're, they're chasing James Bond through like, like the set where they're actually filming right. the, 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 the moonwalks. Well, let's stuff. not forget Capricorn one. Yeah. Yeah. Which really right. set the high water mark for let's, let's fake a space, space mission movies. That's right. So, so I, I think that that's part of it. I do feel that the separation between the sixties and seventies, when the space mm -hmm. race was actually like in full heat and, um, and, the, you know, the astronauts were walking on the moon and now, which is like a generation uh, or two have gone by. Right. And everyone is separate now uh, and they have these devices. They have, we have all this AI stuff where everything can be fake. We just saw that right now, you know? So um, I yeah. think that that, I think that is probably one of the, the, uh, the you know, the, the separation and the time and then the changes in technology have made a, a whole new generation susceptible to, to not believing kind of established facts. I mean, we can talk about facts versus reality and people not accepting facts in science and stuff like that mm -hmm. until the cows come home. Uh, and this could be, you know, part number one. But what I think that we'll see 
a lot of this change in the near future because, uh, or people double down on it because NASA says they're like a few years away from actually landing people on the moon again with, you know, very similar technology. It's a little bit updated, but like the physics are the same, uh, for it. And if these like, like, like theorists are still chowding the same thing about the new stuff, That'll be very interesting right. to see too. Because I was going to say, you know, NASA could go, they, they don't plan to, but they could land near a former Apollo site and stroll over there. And of course, there are a lot of people that'll say, oh, well, they just went back to the same studio and that's the old standing set. So I, I have to add, I think, you know, this is an interesting time period because when we talk about the first moon landing in 1969, this was very much the go-go jet set hippie late 60s. And if you know people from that that time period, or in my case, experienced it as a young man, there was a lot of mistrust of government and, quote, the man, unquote. Mm -hmm. Anything that's an authority figure was bound to get you in trouble and, and start land wars in Asia and so forth. And so I think some of this, at least the intensity of it, I think, may be leveraged by the fact that there was a lot of pushback on authority and on systems and on government. We didn't trust the government. We had just had the Vietnam debacle. We were coming up on the Richard Nixon uh, years of, of increased mistrust of government. So I think that has something to do with it. Um, and I've talked about this on the show before, but uh, when I'm on shows like Coast to Coast AM, which is a big, much larger audience than ours radio <laughs> show that's on every night uh, and deals with conspiracies and ghosts and paranormal and so forth. Um, I enjoy doing the show. The second hour is call-ins, and there's always at least one or two that are that are kind of odd and that, that, you know, talk about the whole moon conspiracy thing. And I used to go in this big, long parable about, you know, well, okay, you know, go to the archives, look through the photos, look through the tapes, go to the museums, touch the rockets, blah, blah, blah. Of course, nowadays, if you touch the rockets, the security guards will come taser you. But, <laughs> you know, look at this evidence. Talk to the moonwalkers. Look them in the eye and see if you think they're lying to you. And then I, I was thinking about it, and I did some research. I was reading some papers. It's like, well, duh, you don't have to do that. Just look at the stuff that came out of the Soviet Union after the collapse in the early 90s. They were tracking everything we did up there. Mm -hmm. They had radar and we're monitoring radio and you can monitor the Doppler shift of radio and get some idea of where it's coming from and what speed the spacecraft is moving and all that. And certainly on the trip back to earth where they're moving as fast as 25,000 or so miles per hour, you know, you can tell that they're not sitting somewhere in, in Burbank faking it on a soundstage. Um, you know, you could build an argument, Oh, you know, these are tapes being played out of a spacecraft that was uncrewed and and to be fair to that body of thought the russians did fly uh as i think it was zon 4 zon 5 they were doing a, a series of experimental shots to loop the moon before they were going to try and, and send their cosmonauts to the moon which they never did um and at one point nasa and or the cia got pretty freaked out because we actually heard a taped voice coming from the spacecraft that had just <laughs> looped the moon turned out it was taped it was a tape recorder being played the only things on the only live things on that spacecraft were i think two tortoises and some fruit flies but we heard this voice coming from the oh. spacecraft it's like oh my gosh they've stolen our thunder but Tortoise, there's just so much tor evidence tor tortoises at the moon you know I'd yeah watch so. I, I have a, a whole a whole chapter in Amazing Stories of Space Age about the the turtle knots. <laughs> um, so you know we could take the whole rest of the episode talking about that we never went to the moon theories. But I, I think I would I would just I would just point out I mean because I think one of them is that NASA is like isn't real either, right? That's like another <laughs> and, right. That's like NASA. It's like it's all a big lie. And I will tell you as someone that has witnessed twenty plus space shuttle mission launches and and who knows how many you know of like other rocket launches but if it's all a lie it's pretty convincing you know <laughs> that yeah. you go out there and that that you're waiting to watch this thing with you and thousands of other people are, are watching it happen and yet no one is coming out to say hey hey by the way so i totally pulled this job on like uh at nasty the other day no one is saying any of that stuff you know at least that we know about um i think that they're connected you know and uh, and it's probably for a lot of the same reasons that you were just talking about that, that distrust mm -hmm. of government, you know, it's really highly visible. A lot of people see that it, it think they think it's a waste of money. You know, I have that discussion in my own home 
over time. Well, and, and a lot of those people who think it's a waste of money think it's up to 25% of the federal budget as yeah. opposed to one 100%. half of 1%. 1%. 1%. <laughs> one half. All right. Well, before we move on, because we have a long list that we're, we're not going to be able to close out. But um, before we move on, let's take a moment to hear from our sponsors. All right. Um, this one I love because mainly I just want to jump to this because it's such fun. And I can't <laughs> believe that people actually believe it. So ooh, ooh, I think I know what you're what we're going to talk. Yeah, about. you do. So <laughs> if anybody had the poor fortune of seeing the movie Iron Sky, you know what I'm about to talk about. Oh, no. Oh, we're, we're jumping to Nazis on the moon. <laughs> so or Iron Sky 2, the sequel, right? Yeah. And, and I actually know the guy who wrote Iron, the first Iron Sky. He's He was a friend from back in the late 80s when I was uh, producing short films for Disney. I, I hired him as part of a crew, brilliant guy, good writer. And I saw his credit for Iron Sky. So I, I called him and I said, Mike. Uh, uh, how, what, what were you doing? You know, and he said, look, that wasn't the movie I wrote. Okay. And so he explained to me, I mean, it was a pretty compelling, it was fun. It was still kind of fun, silly, but. Oh, Iron Sky really- is wonderful. It's so much fun. So, everyone should watch it. I think it's on Amazon. Oh, stop. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We like our audience. It was, it was schlock. Okay, I mean, we, we can agree to disagree. There's, there's a fun <laughs> core there. It's this idea of Nazis on the moon. But the way they played it out and this whole, you know, that third act of the battle coming back to Earth and all that. I mean, it was a full act too long <laughs> and just a, a a kind of a beautiful mess. It, it's like, uh, you know, looking at some some long faded uh, actor who's had way too much plastic surgery. You, you just look well, at the film thinking you should have stopped while you were so, ahead. So let's, let's explain the theory. Yes, then. please let's do. Let, yeah. No, well you, I need you to explain this theory. Cause I tell you, I oh, thought you it was just a sci-fi. It. I thought it was just a sci-fi, a sci-fi plot. And then, right. No, no, you're like, people actually believe this. Well, so in 1947, uh, Robert Heinlein's book, rocket ship Galileo was published. And there are claims of big Nazi rockets, uh, uh, and so forth, having landed on and set up business on the moon. So the idea, whole idea is after World War II and the Nazis were losing, they all boarded all those big, extra large V2 rockets that Werner von Braun had been building to bomb London and Belgium and so forth and headed off to the moon to build a base. Now, if you've ever seen a V2, they're not very big. And the Redstone rocket, which which could not even get Alan Shepard into orbit back in 1961, was basically a reskinned V2. So we know that their lifting capacity is about enough to put your right shoe uh, in, <laughs> uh, into a, a suborbital trajectory. But, of course, you know, it's much more fun to believe that the Nazis had wonder weapons beyond that. Um, some of the stuff that's been written about this claims that they had figured out anti-gravity. So it wasn't just bigger rockets. It was anti-gravity and flying saucers, probably based on the saucer shaped. Uh, was it a Hankel's uh, aircraft that they yeah, had they, they, had, they had that jet, that Taylor's jet that was like the saucer. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously they had mastered all this alien technology and, you know, this is not too far removed from their secret base in Antarctica and their, their occult weapons program, I suppose, but that they actually, the Germans actually had the technology to build a base on the moon, which in Iron Sky, (laughs) by the way, uh, and I think we have, uh, we already saw the picture of it. Their, their first view of this base on the moon is this big capital building shaped like a swastika. It's brilliant. That's right. It's really fun. So, so that's the idea that, uh, and and by the way, there it is. Beautiful. Um, the V2 had a maximum altitude, one flight claimed of 117 miles. 62 is the th- theoretical boundary of space, quote unquote, meaning, you know, the atmospheric change, not orbit. But um, it just, you know, it's a hard one to buy with the technology. Oh, and by the way, we photographed pretty much every square inch of the moon and have not yet found that building. But wouldn't it be fun if we had? Well, it's because it's on the far side of the moon, right? Isn't that the whole plan? The dark side. It's on the dark side of the moon. So that's the, the dark side that gets light and dark every two weeks, just like the <laughs> front side does, but we love to call the dark side. Um, so so Tark proved to me, proved to me that there isn't a German base on the moon with Nazis waiting to come back and reclaim their, their status on Earth. Well, I would say what's taking them so long, right? If if they're if they're there. But you're right. You know, we we've we've sent and it's not just uh it's not just NASA sending spacecraft to, to 
photographed the entire right. moon, which you can look up like full maps of the entire far side of the moon, including the side that, that we see uh, all the time. But China has had orbiters around the mm -hmm. moon. India has had orbiters around the moon. And unless they're all in on it, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that one of those countries would have said, uh, you know, hey, you know, we, we found this weird thing and uh, right. and we should probably call somebody about it. The Nazis so, aren't on the moon. They're obviously in the center of the earth. I don't know. If about see? Oh, see that, yeah, how did we miss that one? You're so <laughs> right, Anthony. Huh. Yeah. And, and, and what you just pointed out also plays back the whole landing on the moon thing. You know, uh, the Chinese, uh, there's a little bit of stress between the U.S. and China right now. I kind of think that between the Chinese and the Soviet Union slash Russia, somebody might have called us out if they got in lunar orbit and said, hey, there are no landing stages there mm -hmm. from the Apollo lunar module. There are no tracks from the rovers. I mean, we photographed it, we being the U.S., but of course we could have faked that. I suppose we want to carry this to extremes, but those other guys looked down and said, yeah, shoot. Yeah, they've been here. So <laughs> I think it would be pretty hard to fake. Um, you know, there is such a rich body of stuff. We're going to have to do a follow-up episode because we're not going to be able to get through it all. Uh, do you, uh, I'm going to let you pick the next one. we got flat earth. we got planet nine. we got face on Mars. we got the Saturn mm. hexagon, alien autopsy. I mean, there's so many. What a rich area. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but you know, let's do the hexagon. So the hexagon and Saturn, I, this, this is uh, a feature of, um, of, of, of Saturn. Like I think there's one of the South pole too, but it's mostly the, the North pole. But the big the, ones on the North pole. The, the yeah. big ones at the North pole. And uh, NASA's Cassini spacecraft found this in 2006 uh, with like super high res images. And it was like a, a hexagon with another or actually of no, uh, Voyager. They went back and they they, they found them. They did the see yeah, right? echoes of it, the Voyager pictures, but they're so low res, it's hard to spot. Yeah, and so so the these these hexagons are they're they're bizarre because it it's you know we're we're used to clouds in bands around these big gas pines, and you you see the circle bands as, around around Saturn, and then you get up and up and closer to the top, and then there's this hexagon, and then there's like another hexagon inside it, and the reason that I like this one is because I was no joke at the gym. Uh, on one of those those exercise bikes that well, has I'm kind like, of shocked that you were at the gym. Well, start, hey, but, hey, you know. hey, I, I, <laughs> I do my I do my part. I'm not there no, yet. You're but. looking good. I'm just <laughs> just kidding. So so I'm at the gym and I'm on the exercise bike and I'm fiddling through the little the little screen that it has so you can watch shows and and I think it was the Science Channel and there's this documentary and it's all about Cassini and how wonderful it is and look at these amazing images and this hexagon and you know the science behind yeah. it must be extraordinary look at the fidelity of the images and then it says it's a refueling station for aliens and I was like what kind of documentary. <laughs> Am I, am I watching Well, and, 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 and why a refueling station? I, I can I, see, you know, I know that the, part of the theory behind this was that, that the aliens put it there uh, to welcome us to space voyaging or that God put it there to tell us to head back to Earth or whatever, but and, a refueling and, station? Yeah, like a, like a refueling station because they're there manipulating the, the, the atmosphere to funnel it so that they can go there and, and land mm. and do that stuff. And that's, it's, it's the fact that- Land on Saturn. Land, well, you know, above it to like siphon okay, it off I was gonna like say, a straw, yeah, I would It's assume. not much hard ground there, but, but go ahead. But the, the I, th I think that the, the, the really driving force of this is that here is a planet you know, a sphere that we, we've seen uh, cloud bands around forever. And then there's this weird angular shape, which to our, you know, casual observers seems like it should not be there. And, right. and that is what's driving uh, this, 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 these theories that it must not be natural because we can't have like hexagons naturally, uh, you know, out there. And it's still really just strange to see. The thing is, it's still there, like right now. You know, if we had a spacecraft in orbit around Saturn, you know, Cassini crashed uh, back, what was that, 2015? 20... Uh, 16? Yeah. Something that went, oh, when it, here, Anthony's got a boat. Oh, there, there, there's, there's our hexagon. Yeah, that's much cooler. Yeah. And, and I got to admit, yeah, you look at it, you think there's this big sort of alien eye staring at you. Yeah. It does seem what is unusual. It? You know, straight lines are not something you normally see in nature. Hexagons are not commonly seen in nature, although there are fracture patterns in rocks and so forth, frost thaws that, that will show that kind of thing. But it, it is particularly weird 
looking. I mean, um, it, it rotates every 10, you know, 11, 10 hours, 40 yeah. minutes. You know, it's, it's 8,600 miles across, you know. And, and that's the weird thing. It's been there for a long time. It's probably going to be there for a long time to come. And the early, uh, I guess you call it planetary climatologists or atmospheric scientists said, you know, this doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of wind shear patterns because we know that there's a lot of high speed winds on Saturn and um, weird atmospheric phenomenon. They were able to measure the depth of it. It appears to persist about 60 miles deep into the atmosphere, which is also not something you would necessarily expect from if it was just affecting the upper layers. So one of the theories I read, other than the fact that it's an alien refueling station, <laughs> is that this is a standing wave pattern or possibly shaped by our rural discharges, which we know there are a lot of on Saturn's poles, sculpted by electrical charges, magnetic fields, and so forth. But, um, you know, th this is one of those beautiful things where you just have to admit we don't know. And sometimes yeah. that's the nicest answer of all. Yeah, just accept that nature is beautiful. You know, so yeah. and that's the staple of science fiction, by the way. There are a series of books by Jack McDivitt, uh, who, who says that uh, aliens put these types of things on, and giant statues on on or, or obelisks or whatever on different bodies so that when we find them, it leads us to wherever they are in the cosmos. I don't think that's what we're seeing here. But, you know, and, and there is a similar theory to the red spot of Jupiter, because why, right. why has that storm been there for so long is because it's artificially constructed. It's like a signal post to, to hide whatever. And then put a smiley face on it if you're going to do that. Don't just and, give me a big red spot. And and in in that that sci-fi movie about Jupiter, what's her name? The girl, the, the the star's name. Her name is Jupiter. Jupiter descending. Uh -huh. Like they have a whole alien civilization living in the spot, like being hidden by it. So I mean, like there's lots of reasons that they, that that make them like a uh, uh, magnets for those kinds of theories there. So so let me just close this one with uh, a note that in 2010 there was a team at Oxford University of uh, of I guess they were physicists who did a a fluid dynamics experiment, which had a rotating water tank and they actually formed a hexagonal pattern uh -huh. that was maintained for a period of time. So apparently with, with fluids of a certain density moving at a certain speed, you can set up this kind of standing wave thing and get yourself a hexagon. So, um, I'm sure we're going to get some some email on this one, but <laughs> we, you know, I, I thought that was very cool that they're able to replicate the uh, a natural phenomenon yeah. in, in a somewhat natural way, which is very scientific, and people should take note that they can do that because then it takes the Science. mystery off of it a little bit. So, uh, why don't you pick the next one? We probably only have time for one Gosh, more. I Man, know. we have like fifty of them here. They're well, talking I, about the face I was on busy Mars this week. Uh, um, uh, Mars and the full moon, all sorts of fun stuff. Well, Area I know 51. One, of your, one of your favorites, uh, you, you talk about the jelly donut on Mars frequently, so <laughs> I'm going to let you start on that one. So we see a lot of weird stuff on Mars. Um, there's been everything from jelly donuts to Sasquatch to artillery pieces. These are rock features or tricks of light and shadow. Of course, famously, the face on Mars is Sidonia reason back mm -hmm. from the Viking photos. And my favorite was the white rabbit. The little Playboy Bunny, yes, which um, actually turned out to be a piece of uh, cloth off of one of the landers. I think that's it was right. Mur, wasn't it, or was it Pathfinder? Oh no, that that was from I think it was from Opportunity because I remember writing yeah. that story uh, way back. Okay, when. yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it, unfortunately, the little rabbit blew away one afternoon in in a thin Martian wind. But most of these things are rocks. Um, and you know, I mean, you see, there's that one of the doorway which I think I put a link to mm -hmm. there, which really is weird looking. It was kind of like that uh, cabin on the moon from a couple of years ago. You see this big square thing. Oh, You're just yeah. not used to seeing square lines in nature, uh, straight lines in nature or squares. So this does look like a doorway, but for anybody who spent time in the Southwestern United States, um, you see a lot of weird stuff in rock formation, <laughs> even with Earth weather. And Martian weather, of course, has been standing and, and uninterrupted for much longer. Yeah, so you and, get some very weird geological features. And the 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 the, the theories here are, are not that it's just one doorway or one kind of Sasquatch or uh, reclining woman, I think was another explanation for the Sasquatch shape that we saw. Mm. Uh, or or the or the jelly donut. The jelly donut, by the way, we didn't call it that. All right, Steve Squires right. says, "Look at this crazy rock that we Steve found." Steve Squires, who is the mission Steve scientist, Squires, who is the mission scientist in charge of the Mars exploration the, rovers, the rover yeah. missions, said, "It looks like a jelly donut. Isn't that great?" And wouldn't you know, 
in the inbox <laughs> after I wrote that story, because we say that, you know, it finds a jelly donut rock on Mars. Yes. Uh, is that NASA is hiding that it really is, in fact, uh, a, a jelly donut, a, a jelly donut, but not like not like a tasty one. It's a living creature and NASA is hiding it and everything like that. It's a now, can you believe Duncan Dodens or Winchell's didn't grab that opportunity to. I think that they would now, you know, yeah. have a jelly donut. They but. But if you're going to hide something, I don't think that you're going to present it in a in a free online NASA talk uh, for the entire world to see, unless you know that's part of the that's part of the conspiracy. Area. But the whole the whole point is that we all like. I mean, at, at space.com, we love to write about things that look like other things, right? It's just it gives me so much glee when you find uh, a rock that looks like you know a truck or who knows what, you know, something mm. something fun. That doorway is awesome because it looks really cool there was another like a really sculpted rock that was heavier on top mm -hmm. than on the bottom we see a lot of that in the american southwest right from right. the weathering right, and whatnot right. but we don't see a lot of it on mars and when they see it it's like oh who balanced that rock on top of that other rock it must have been <laughs> right it must have been aliens Ooh. right um and, and, uh, and by the way, do aliens really have nothing better to do than tease us over the millennia? <laughs> I mean, don't right. they have jobs well, or football games to watch or something? Well, the face on Mars, that was the plot of the, the movie Mission oh. to Mars. Like they actually had that it was covered by dirt. That's why it looks all so let's, let's talk about that for a second. So this is one of the early, I mean, I, I can't call the earliest thoughts about Mars of, of, ancient civilization there and canals and all that stuff that kind of peaked with Percival Lowell around 1905. Those are conspiracies. Those yeah. were genuine what passed at the time for scientific inquiry, although not everybody agreed with them, of course. But uh, so Viking goes in orbit around Mars in 1975, lands in 1976. And these are two large flagship level probes. Viking one with, and Viking two. Yeah. Yes. With orbiters and landers. Uh, very, very successful. And best cameras available at the time snap pictures of this region called Sidonia. And we see this thing that, by golly, it looks like a face. It's got two <laughs> eyes and a weird little nose and a mouth. And it's just kind of staring blandly at us, not smiling, not frowning. Uh, from the, the kind of moderate resolution cameras of the time. So there were high resolution and low resolution cameras. The... Most famous images that we see of this were based on a combination of five final images that were something like a resolution of about 164 feet per pixel. So that's not a lot of resolution. Um, showed this face like feature. 164 is, feet, that's like a 16 story building. That's yeah, like your one pixel. And that's one <laughs> pixel. Right. So it's, it's pretty low res. So this feature is about uh, 1.2 miles across, which by my, uh, possibly erroneous calculation is about 32 pixels wide 20 years later so we had this big gap between viking and the next thing and then 20 so, so two decades nothing much is going on and then we start sending more orbiters in the pathfinder rover and uh lander back to mars and 20 years later we've got images from mars global surveyor u.s probe mars express european probe and mars reconnaissance orbiter u.s probe 46 feet per pixel which we have since had higher res than that but when you look at it in those images where's the it's face? just a weathered doll <laughs> yeah it's this weird it looks like somebody erased it but you can kind of see some of the sculpted features that resulted in that weird fuzzy low resolution thing that did look like a face but of course if you're a true died in the wool conspiracist <laughs> you look at that and say well of course nasa drew that because they didn't want people to know um what was the name of the guy who made so much bank off of this Oh, I, I can't oh, remember. Goodness. He wrote, uh, I think, Dark NASA and a bunch of other books. I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. Richard. No, I'll, I got look, you. I'll it look it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and that's the great thing about conspiracies and UFOs and so forth. There's a Richard, lot more. Richard Hoagland and Mike Hoagland. Hoagland. Yeah. Richard. Who Hoagland. was uh, released from JPL in disgrace, as, as I have heard from people there. Um, for a number of reasons and went off and, and made millions and millions of dollars writing these conspiracy theory books and doing seminars and stuff. There's a lot more money in UFOs and conspiracies and paranoia than there is in trying to there, teach there science, is, unfortunately. There is a tendency. We didn't talk about this yet, but this is where a lot of these, these theories come from. 
because there are people that just go through all the raw data every single day coming down right. from curiosity, from perseverance, from the, the, the original Vikings and whatnot, um, to, to look for every little thing. Um, and there is a, 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 a thing we talked a little bit about a parody earlier, this, this tendency of the human eye and your brain to see a pattern or something familiar and something that, that is truly random. It's how, why you see pareidolia pareidolia. Yeah. Uh, it's why you see, you know, a hippo, uh, in a fluffy cloud or something like that, because your brain is looking for something familiar to connect with you. It's why, you know, we have landmarks that look like, uh, people, you know, the, those legends of this mountain was this, um, this, this queen or whatever, you know, and, and, and the tales that come up out of that o- over time. Um, well, excuse me, but why can't that cause people to look at me at the beach and see a strapping guy with, right? with, with right? big pecs and a look, six pack? Look, look, right. Instead look. of grandpa. <laughs> yeah, I know. It just doesn't work. But, but pray continue. Uh, so, so, so there is, there is that condition and people just, you know, they see it and they get convinced that that's what it is. But these images, we have to uh, remember, if you want to confirm something uh, on earth, you see a rock that looks like a lizard, you can get closer to that rock and like, like look over mm. from this side and from that side. And is it, is it a rock, uh, that just looks like a lizard from that angle, or is it really a dangerous lizard that's going to like bite my finger off if I get too close to it <laughs> when I try to poke it uh, with a stick? And uh, and and so we've 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 got that in our brain because we're looking for those kinds of dangers or whatnot uh, over time. And these images that we get from Mars are one snapshot. We don't get to walk around the object to see all of those little things. And if you do do it. You see like what we saw with the face on Mars, you look at it from different angles, it's going to look different. The lighting is different or whatever, and you don't get that perfect, um, that perfect set. And that's what's missing from a lot of these theories about, oh, there's a woman on Mars. Oh, there's a door on Mars. Oh, this, this rock is clearly the leftovers of an alien dinner on Mars, you know? <laughs> no, that's not what we're seeing, you know? And then there's the scale too, right? Because that right. door, I recall, was like, like a foot tall or, or 30 inches yeah, tall, something, tiny. something yeah. it was, it was small. It looks like a human sized door because we are humans. And you know, if we see well, that, we're but, like, well, that but, must be, but, but no, but lower gravity and they'd be smaller. Right. <laughs> Come on. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I I'm having so much fun. I really hate to stop, but we, we do need to um, let's mark the ones we didn't do. So we can get yeah. back to this. However, I do want to say, to our, our, our beloved listeners, if you like this episode, please drop us an email. Let us know. If you didn't drop us like it, drop us an email. Let us know why. Uh, I, I love doing these things, but, you know, we're here for you, so we'd, we'd love to hear. But we want to thank you for joining us today for our discussion of our favorite space conspiracies. <laughs> Tarek. Where can we keep track of your conspiracies? Well, you can always find me at space.com. Maintaining the fire that the earth is round, which we didn't even talk about. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, well, that's, it's like a half episode <laughs> on its own. And of course on, on the Twitter at, uh, at Tarek J Malik. Uh, and, um, and how about you? How about you, Rod? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, you can always find me at pilebooks.com. That's P Y L E books.com. And at ad Astor magazine.com and Twitter and Facebook and all that jazz. Please don't forget to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv. We always welcome your thoughts, comments, suggestions, even insults. And um, we answer each and every email that we get. Don't forget also to check out space.com. As mentioned, the website is in the name. And the National Space Society at nss.org. Both are good places to satisfy your space light cravings and maybe even spend some money. New episodes of this Podcast published every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, give us reviews, and like us, because we all need to be liked. You can also head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. And don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free on Club Twit, as well as some extras that are only available there for just $7 per month. And isn't that a bargain? Finally, you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and we'll see you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. 
And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.